To me, having good health is about making those great choices that are constantly going to pour into you and less of what's taking away from you. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today, we're going to be learning about acupuncture and Chinese medicine. We'll be sharing tips on how to achieve good health and balance in your life. Our guest today is Dr. Eileen Lee. Dr. Eileen is a licensed acupuncturist and Chinese medicine doctor, a physical therapist, and now an accidental content creator and influencer. Her journey began with her mother, who was also a Chinese medicine doctor. From a young age, Chinese medicine has helped her recover fast from migraines, the common cold, and injuries from sports. It was natural for her to spread knowledge and help people realize alternatives to recovery and wellness. With her emerging social media presence on TikTok and Instagram, she loves dispersing health tips, a lot around pain, and creating conversation with a fun and digestible approach. With almost 10 years of clinical experience from all different facets of healthcare practices and her own personal experiences, Eileen is passionate about helping people empower themselves in health, both on and offline. Before we begin, a quick reminder that if you're looking for the best way to plan your year, check out the 2023 Artist of Life Workbook. It's a guided journal to help you achieve all your goals this year, and you can find it at shop.lavendaire.com. All right, on to the show. Hello, Dr. Eileen. Welcome to the podcast. How are you feeling today? I am great, Eileen, because I love meeting another Eileen. <laughs> I know. I love it. It's always weird to call someone else Eileen, but I, I love it at the same time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So how did you get into acupuncture and Chinese medicine? So the long story short, um, I grew up with Chinese medicine my whole life, and I really mean that. Um, my background, I'm, I am Chinese, and um, when my mom immigrated to the States, she she went to acupuncture school and I think at the age of 40 and I also decided, well, I didn't really have a choice. She also brought me along to acupuncture school. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was my first impression introduction to Chinese medicine, which I thought, wow, this stuff is so weird and so voodoo. But at the same time, um, it helped me out a lot. Um, when she was a student, I would sit in, uh, for classes with her and whatnot. And I didn't understand any of it at the time. I was just bored, but I mm-hmm. would constantly be around the herbal pharmacy room and constantly seeing her be with patients. So I had this really nice exposure at a young age. And then as I grew into who I am today, it was nice to retroactively look back at you know, all the things that I got to learn about Chinese medicine with my mom. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing that you started so young. And is, is your mom still working in Chinese medicine now? You know, it's funny. We joke like she retired, but she's unretiring now. <laughs> oh, why? She she just wants to get back into it? I think that it's very hard to leave this kind of medicine, right? For her, it's it's not just about treating patients, right? It's something that she truly enjoys. And I'm very similar to her. Although she's a bit introverted, I'm more extroverted. Um, it's about feeling like you've made a huge change in somebody's life. Yeah, love that. So let's talk more about your story because I know you started as a physical therapist first, right? So what were your decisions going into that? And then when did you pivot to acupuncture? Well, in my upbringing, my dad said to me, Eileen, this is in high school. You need to make a choice. You need to decide what you want to do with the rest of your life. (laughs) And I was like, at 17, like right now. (laughs) So I thought, okay, fine. I did a little like career quiz in high school. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And uh, do you remember those? Yeah, of course. I did so many because I was lost too. Yeah. 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 And like, did your parents say like, you need to make a decision now what you want to do? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Being Asian, that's, that's very, very typical. Right. Um, so I took a career quiz and it said like, be a teacher, be a physical therapist. So I went through every single career and I thought to myself, well, I like being active. I like helping people out. I like education. And that's how I rolled into physical therapy because I knew I could not do a nine to five sit down job that was completely out of my realm. Um, And then I made a decision at 17 that I would become a physical therapist. 
I had no prior experience. You know, uh, a lot of people, like when they go into a profession, they have some kind of experience like with rehab or, you know, they grew up with something. And my mom at that time joked with me. She said, you sure you don't want to do acupuncture? And I was like, no, I'm positive. I, I really don't like it. Um, and uh, I went to PT school in Boston. I went to Simmons College. It was a six-year program, a uh, clinical doctorate program. Mm-hmm. So I was there for the six years learning everything under the sun. And by the time graduation came, I decided that I was going to be specializing in pediatrics and geriatrics, so both young and older. Um, And then I did a little bit of chronic pain research. And by year five as a physical therapist, I felt myself sealing out, kind of burning out in the profession, but also feeling like I feel like there needs to be something else filling in the gap of what I'm doing currently. Like there was more of a, of a reach beyond of just, you know, um, seeing patients for therapeutic exercises and whatnot. So for me, I decided that I, well, I made a decision to, and said to my mom, you know what I have been thinking lately, I might go back to school for acupuncture and Chinese medicine and she smirked and said, oh, yeah, I knew this was going to happen. Wow. And, I mean, that's that's a pivot because like you had a career. You could have continued doing physical therapy. And to go back to school, I mean, how many years is acupuncture and Chinese medicine school? Let it's like a just, whole other topic, it, it, It's like right? medical school. It really yeah. is. It's, it's, a med- it's medical school, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so for acupuncture, the typical programs are just for acupuncture only three years. Wow. But if you add Chinese herbal medicine, it's usually an extra half a year or a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's a commitment. I, it's a commitment. It was. Yeah. And I and I already did grad school once, right? Oh, my gosh. So then I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, like, do I really want to be doing this at 27, like starting a whole new career? You know, meanwhile, at 27, my friends were getting job promotions and I was making great money. And I thought, you know, it was a huge risk for myself. And I thought, but the longevity of what I truly want to do in my life, though I didn't actually know at the time where it would go with Chinese medicine, I just knew that there had to be a change in the way I practiced medicine and health as a physical therapist. And I needed more tools to help my patients. And also, you know, when you practice health and anything in healthcare and in medicine, it's the kind of thing that really gives back to you. So your capacity to be able to heal yourself, to heal your friends and family members, it's something that makes you just more empowered. Before we go on, it's time for a break with our sponsor. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you feel your best, life seems to flow with ease, but sometimes that flow gets disrupted and it's only natural to get overwhelmed and feel disconnected. Get back into your flow with therapy because with the proper support, you can feel empowered to overcome anything and live life to the fullest. Speaking with a therapist on BetterHelp has helped me better understand myself and my mind. What I like about therapy is that having a therapist will help you tap into deeper emotions and fears, ones that you don't really notice in your day-to-day. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Plus, you have the flexibility to switch therapists at any time at no additional charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash TLL. Wow. So going to acupuncture school, I mean, I I guess I want to get into, can you explain (laughs) what acupuncture is and how does it work? Yeah. So I think a lot of people, when they think about acupuncture, they think like there's this huge like energy model component, you know, that's like, oh, what is chi or ti? You know, I don't know if you speak Mandarin. Um, I do speak Mandarin. So for me, like it's Mandarin is my first language um, and then English. So when I was in 
Chinese medicine school, I, I, I completely understood what T was, right? QI. Mm -hmm. um, because as you know, the language is very contextual. So there's a multitude of meanings for one word, right? Um, but being Chinese, I knew it didn't just mean energy. The Chinese were very big on blood health, having right? So having like healthy blood that circulates and having healthy blood that also is able to provide proper nutrients and oxygen to your tissues and your organs so you can function. You know, um, I don't know if you ever go to China, but a lot of people who are older, they're doing like Tai Chi in the park, mm -hmm. right? And they're constantly drinking herbal soups and they're getting acupuncture, right? And that's, that's a big part of our culture. So, you know, when people ask me, well, how does acupuncture work? And isn't it about energy medicine? I, and I always boil it down to two things. One, it's about improving and optimizing your blood health because at its fundamental, that is a lot of what Chinese people believe in, right? And then two, it helps reboot your nervous system. So I always, I tell people, you know, your body is like, it's like a computer, a, or like a like a iPhone and you have software updates, right? So people who are living with chronic pain or their body's not optimized, you need updates to it, right? And when you're in pain and when you're sick, things can't get updated because, you know, something happened along the way. You know, you got a virus or um, you deleted something very important from your operating system. So acupuncture works in the way where you know, we come in, we put needles in to help guide the body to healing and re-optimizing the software update. And on top of that, being your body is like a computer, you're also updating your hardware. So that's also adding some components like cupping therapy or gua sha to the acupuncture. So all, all of these things are a huge catalyst to helping your body be at its best. Yeah. When you say update, what does that refer to in the body? <laughs> yeah. So when I say update, let's, for instance, somebody living with chronic pain, they have a pain threshold that's very, very low. So if I touch their shoulder, you know, the way their brain perceives pain would be highly more sensitive than if you were to touch my shoulder where my pain threshold is a little higher. So by improving the blood flow and also rebooting the nervous system, what you're doing is you're changing people's perceptions about the way they perceive pain and also sending all this information and goodness into the brain and interpreting that message saying, this is how your body should operate. This is how you should perceive, you know, the way things should truly feel. Okay. Okay. Got it. Can you give us some examples of like how you've personally seen acupuncture change people's lives? Oh yeah. This is one of my favorite stories. So um, when I first started my solo practice, very, very small startup last year, one of my first patients um, was this mom, probably around in her forties. And she came in as a referral from another patient of mine. They were sisters and she came in and, you know, definitely a, a much more quiet kind of soul kind of, you know, doesn't, I can tell that she wasn't expressing like what she truly felt even when I was doing the initial exam. And, um, I asked her one question. I, I asked her if there's anything in this world, if you weren't in so much neck and back pain, like what is something that you truly want to get back to? And, and I asked this question to everyone and, and she said, I just, I just want to get rid of this pain. And I said, okay, that's fine. I treated her. The next day, she called me and she said, hi, um, I thought a lot about what you said. And I said, yeah, so what do you think? And she says, I was in so much pain, I couldn't even focus on the question. But this morning I woke up and I was in the car with my husband and we were driving and I realized like the pain just wasn't as bad. And I thought to myself, I want to be able to drive by myself independently again. She had not driven herself since a motor vehicle accident for the last two years. So her family has been the main support of catering her or driving her, Ubering her everywhere. 
um, you know, to doctor appointments, to acupuncture, to grocery stores, you know, once upon a time, two years ago, she was able to drive her family to, you know, sporting events or picking up her kids from school. Um, and I said, great, let's work on it. Every time I saw her and I, in probably less than three months, she was driving by herself again. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a big part of it was just being able to change the way she perceived pain that we were able to raise her threshold of pain that was so low to up here that with every treatment her brain chemistry improved. Mm-hmm. All the happy hormones came in her endorphins, you know, her serotonin rays, those are all the happy chemical messengers that we need to sleep better, function better. Um the way we want to enjoy events in our lives. Yeah. You talk about, it's about changing how we perceive pain. I mean, I always thought, I mean, this could just be a myth, but like pain was a, like it's your body telling you something is wrong. So if you're saying you're changing how they perceive it, is it, I don't know, how do you explain that? Are you covering it up or are you actually relieving the pain? (laughs) Well, okay. That's, that's a great question. So one, yes, we are actually relieving the pain, right? Um, the way I practice acupuncture, there's multiple ways to bake a cake, right? But the way I practice is, uh, is what I call distal acupuncture. So needling hands and feet, your hands and feet are very sensitive, right? Um, and they correspond to different body parts in your body. And it's like a, like a microsystem of like, let's say the hand is a microsystem of like your entire spine, right? Or your neck. So being able to change someone's pain, because what happens is you have a traumatic event and you, the pain goes up. And at some point with healing normal tissue timelines, the pain should be able to come down and you kind of return to homeostasis. But for people living with chronic pain, they go up and they stay at a high level of sensitivity and alertness. Pain is really important in our body. You need pain in order to perceive danger, right? So when I say that we're changing the way their brain thinks about pain is that we are taking that level of high risk security and bringing it down so that their muscles don't guard as much, right? Their anticipation for pain is not as high. I see. Oh, yeah. So you're talk- talking specifically about chronic pain, like it's caused yeah. by some sort of trauma. But, like but your even body- acute pain too. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Um, let's talk about, yeah, I think a lot of people look at acupuncture like, oh, if you're sticking a needle in your hand, how does it correspond to another part of your body? Why don't you explain that to like a a person who doesn't understand uh, like, you know, these pressure points, things like that. I have a great example. (laughs) I have, I have my, um, Love it. Yeah. Acupuncture model You see here. these in the Chinese medicine doc- like doctor's <laughs> you see, office? You see it everywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so in Chinese, Chinese medicine, in acupuncture, we have what we call meridians. The way I look at meridians, they are more like the original nervous system roadmap right? Like we all know what a brain is. That's our, our central, con- you know, control center, right? And then we all have a spinal cord. And in that spinal cord, we have all these cables running down, okay, in our spinal cord. And they go out to our hands and to our feet, right? So we call those peripheral nerves. So those nerves go out from the, from the spinal cord and out to the hands and feet. When you're needling the hands and feet, the legs, the arms, what you're doing is what I call reverse engineering. So there are certain acupuncture points that in these acupuncture points, it's a concentration of nerves and arterial blood vessels that are the most sensitive, but are the, also the most impactful. So when you needle it, it sends a direct message. It happens in nanoseconds back to the brain and says, what's going on? Okay. And at that level at the brain, the brain says, oh, my body is telling me to relax this section of my back via the hand, because there are certain nerves that talk to the brain that are also at the same level of the arms and limbs as long along with the back. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But can you explain like why those points are the most impactful? You mentioned? 
Yeah. So those points are usually the most impactful. A lot of it comes from ancient Chinese literature, right? So back in the day, they had a lot of free time. Basically, they didn't have iPhones, they didn't have MacBooks or anything like that. They didn't have TikTok or Instagram. So a lot of them studied the nervous system pathways. And at the time, and then they also studied what we call the circulatory system, right? And they found that there were certain circulatory pathways and nervous system pathways that had the same profound effect and at the same level of treating pain you know, without directly treating at the site of pain. And they knew that certain areas of the hands, arms, feet, and and legs would treat back pain. It was a lot of trial and error. It wasn't so much, I would say, as scientific, right? So then what happens in modern day society is that in clinical research, they study these group of points and they find that a lot of these nerves are at the same level of, of certain organs like your stomach, your liver, your kidneys. So, you know, needling a very specific point, uh, you know, at the base of your ankle and leading it back into the adrenals, which are your kidneys, would treat, you know, kidney disease or adrenal fatigue, that kind of thing. Right. So when you're needling that area, that's a signal to your brain to, is it, does it like boost what is it, blood flow or immune, your immune system? Or <laughs> at, its, at its most simplest, you know, in this because medicine can get very complicated, you know. Yeah, like uh, what exactly is happening then when yeah, you're needling a Yeah, it's actually, you know, I would explain it to people like, you know, you in your body, in the center of your body, you have like a main pipe and then you have your heart and you have to have good heart health, right? And that's your pump. So your heart p- constantly pumps blood and it pumps oxygenated blood throughout your body. And then the, the other side of your body through your veins is receiving deoxygenated blood and puts it back into your heart. And when you're breathing in, right, you're taking in healthy, hopefully healthy oxygen, right? And exchanging for that poor oxygen, that deoxygenated blood out of the body. So that's how you're constantly rejuvenating your body through better respiration, right? And then delivering that healthy blood and oxygen to your tissues and organs. Okay, got it. Um, What I also love about your TikTok and the resources you post is so much of it is like, are things we can do at home? Like you don't have to know acupuncture, but you can learn to like press, like do acupressure on certain points, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. It kind of started... um, accidentally. (laughs) Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. I can (laughs) briefly talk about it. So um, when I started my business, um, I had a mentor who kind of encouraged us to start on social media. Um, Before at that time, I was on um, Instagram just making posts, you know, very, very small account. And I found that it was more taxing for me to write than it was to just make a video and explain things. So my mentor at the time told us, you know, you guys need to start making videos and one ways to one way to reach people and to help market your business is to make instructional videos. So that's how it kind of really started out for me. And I was like, oh, I hate being on camera. I hate, you know, just talking to myself. It's so silly sometimes. Um, but at some point I got over and I got used to it. Um, and I'm sure for you too, right? Like, you know, when you're first starting out, it's, it's always a little bit awkward. Yep. Yep. But with practice, it just gets easier. Yeah. With practice, it, it definitely gets better. So, um, I would be treating my patients and we'll just, we'll just be talking about life and someone, and one of them will always ask me, yeah, how do you like, um, what's that point you do every time you do that point, like my neck feels better. And I'll be like, oh yeah, I should just make a video about this. So I'll write it down on my phone and I'll make a video later that night. And because I I don't want to repeat myself all the time, I just send them the video. Yeah. I mean, it's efficient. (laughs) It's efficient. And one thing that, um, if anything that I learned as my career first as a physical therapist, people do not retain information well. And people, there, there's so many people who are all sorts of different learners. Some are visual learners, some are kinesthetic, some are, um, they, some like to read, some like to hear. So, you know, everyone's a different learner. So for me, when I make videos, I always try to capture like at least four of those kind of approaches. And 
one of my, it's not a hard rule, but I always tell myself when you make these videos, Eileen, you got to keep it under 60 seconds <laughs> so that people, you know, because these days people are not as attentive to, oh, yeah. <laughs> as you know, yeah. you mm-hmm. know, it's almost like you're giving an elevator pitch every single time. Right. Mm-hmm. And also I try to make the videos um, digestible, easy to understand. You know, when you're doing, you know, if you can't, if you never tried acupuncture and you're intimidated, this is a great way through acupressure to experience what acupuncture can do for you. Right. Right. Yeah. Or if you, if you don't acupuncture and you want to sustain your results, this is another great way to kind of sustain the results. You know, I'm always trying to, I go back to the lens of like trying to empower people, you know, um, taking their freedom back in understanding their body and mind. Yeah. I love that so much because I'm all about like empowering yourself to learn about your body and not rely on somebody else for your health, right? You, you're you in control of your health. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. Like when I was a physical therapist, I worked in the hospitals. I worked in every single setting you can think of. And a lot of my care was dictated by an insurance model. Um, you know, a lot of like what the administrative administrative higher-ups have to say about how I should treat. Yeah, there are things you can and cannot say Uh, or do. (laughs) Exactly. And I, at some point, just became kind of discouraged by it. Mm -hmm. You know, honestly, you know, so many patients needed my help and I wanted to help so many. Some wanted to get better. A lot of them subscribed to what I call the sick care model. So, and what that means is that it's just give me another pill. So it covers up the symptom, but then it covers up that symptom. And then there's another side effect and there's another pill and another and another. At some point you really don't even know what worked and what, you know, what's, what's actually hurting you even more. So for me, I leaving physical therapy was probably one of the best decisions I made, but at at the same time, I didn't really leave it. Mm-hmm. You're still treating people with similar problems, but it's- I'm still treating people with similar problems. You know, it's um, when I was a physical therapist, because when you're doing therapeutic exercises and you're doing pain education, it's a little bit slower for people to have a buy-in, right? But everybody knows physical therapy. Um, but when I became an acupuncturist, I always joke, I say, it's like that, like, um, like everyone knows PT because it's like the pizza place that you know, it's like a pizza place. Everyone has, everyone has had pizza at some point in their lives. Right. But yeah. then you hear about acupuncture. It's like this Baba Ganoush, like this, <laughs> this it sounds like this foreign thing. And yep. it's like, what's Baba Ganoush like? And I have to educate and explain to people and put in a really simple way for them to understand, like, you know, this is what Baba Ganoush is. This is what goes into it. This is how you make it. Um, this is why you should have it. Right. But what I love about acupuncture is that it has such an instantaneous effect. And when you can give that kind of relief and that kind of result for somebody, they have such a big trust and buy-in for something that they don't completely understand yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Can you share what is like your favorite at-home exercise? Maybe something that's like the most popular on on TikTok. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, share some takeaways that our listeners can can do for themselves. Yeah, so one of my favorite points that I always turn to is the one on the hand. So if you just take your hand, Mm -hmm. there's this big meaty part between the thumb and the index finger. You can't miss it, right? I always tell people to press into that point whenever they have sinus or headache issues or if they have neck issues. And I always tell people to press into this point and hold it there. And you know you press into the right point when it feels really achy and uncomfortable. And we want to we want to experience the achy and un- uncomfortableness because what that is saying to me is that there is some kind of stagnation. There's some kind of stress in that tissue that needs to be released. And what people will often find is that their sinuses start to clear up. Their headaches doesn't seem as intense. Their neck doesn't seem as tense as well. So this one is actually one of my favorite points to press. Do you squeeze from both ends or just I one? actually don't even squeeze it. I oh. actually take a digit and uh-huh. I say, find the meaty part. And I say, okay. press in towards your index finger. 
because you want to press in towards the index bone. And that will be, that will trigger probably the most sensitive achiness um, compared to just like pressing on it, right? Because then you're using a lot of hand strength. A lot of what I teach when I do, when I teach acupressure, like in my TikTok or Instagram videos, is that you don't need a lot of pressure to hit a sensitive spot. You just have to be a little more precise. Um, or sometimes, you know, if it's like a more general area, I would say just find the most tender point. Mm-hmm. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious at home, are you always like doing this stuff to yourself? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I treat myself yeah. every week. Absolutely. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the Is beauty it just of it. based on what you need? Like, do you also do acupuncture on yourself as well? So I love to salsa dance. And one thing is that I dance a lot and my hip will hurt, you know, oh. like I'm a human being. Yeah, yeah. You have <laughs> I, to live I, life. Yeah, I live life. You know, I understand like, because when you do something with high repetition at some point, you might have like an injury or you might, you know, also I'm in the 30 plus clubs, so I'm feeling a little stiff these days. Um, so I'll treat myself at home with no issue. And instead of the hand, say I like, I need to get work done. I'll needle like my feet and legs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that way it's like, I could needle my arms or hands, but if I need them, you know, I always have a different body part to treat that still has the same effect. Right. Is there a difference in the hands or feet or are they essentially the same? Like you can choose where to put the pressure or needles. Yeah, you can choose where you can you can put the needles. And and the, is there a difference between like right side, left side, or all, are they all the same? Generally, you know, sometimes it, it depends on who you talk to in terms of acupuncture. But generally, say like if I had left sided hip pain, I would treat the right leg, right? If I have you know right sided hip pain, I would treat with the left leg. But for me, a good measure is to treat both legs because both my hips at some point will feel it. I see. Uh, okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about Chinese herbal medicine. It's so deep. And I feel like West, the Western society and culture has no idea about herbs. And I don't know, like, how would you explain this basically to people who, who don't really understand it? Well, okay. If I were to be honest, because I've taken Chinese herbal medicine in all forms, you know, it, and I mean it in all, have you? Cause like in all forms I've taken it when my mom used to make it as a raw tea. Uh-huh. So basically like taking all the tree roots, barns, yeah, whatever, like earth. <laughs> the earth, taking the earth and boiling it in a pot in the house, smelling for days. And, um, it's, but it's probably the most potent, right? We know that in it's, that's, it's in its rawest form. Um, and also the most effective, But I would say that in modern day society, that's a lot more difficult to take because there is a huge compliance issue with it, right? Because one, it's a process to make, right? And then two, you know, it's not the tastiest. I used to tell my mom, I really hate drinking this dirt water. I I really can't do it. And I would, I was like, I feel so sick, you know, and she would, she would bait me. She'd be like, okay, you're just going to chug this and then I'll give you a piece of candy. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is not worth it. Um, But Chinese herbal medicine, you're right. It is very deep. Um, It also comes in many different formats. Like I just told you about the raw tea. It comes in granules or powders. So you can make a tea. So the format's getting a little bit easier. And then even more easy than that would be, um, you know, taking capsules or Mm. pills or tablets rather. Um, But Chinese herbal medicine can also encompass as food therapy. So taking everyday fruits, um, you know, certain type of beans, they represent different types of organs in the body, depending Mm -hmm. on the color, it represents different elements of the body as well. So herbal medicine is as is as intense and potent and effective as making raw tea versus just eating everyday food as well as, you know, as, as therapy. Um, in terms of, you know, how I use Chinese herbal medicine, I always look at it as supplemental versus just treating a symptom because the way acupuncture and Chinese herbal medicine work is that when we come and make a diagnosis, right? We don't say, hey, you you have neck pain? 
that's your official ICD-10 code. That's what they would say in the hospitals, you know, like that's your Western diagnosis, neck pain, or, you know, um, oh, you have kidney disease, which we would never say, you know, um, we would, we might say like, oh, you have like kidney deficiency. It has an entirely different meaning. We, because we always look at people as patterns and not so much as the word disease. Every human being has a certain set of patterns. And that is how Chinese medicine diagnoses, um, you know, the, the everyday person. And to confirm the diagnosis, we don't have things like MRIs or x-rays, right? We, we learn to confirm the diagnosis through the tongue and also the pulse, okay? Mm. So with these two main ways of confirming and diagnosing tongue and pulse and also questioning, um, what happens then is that when we make you know, acupuncture prescriptions, so protocols, or when we form like um, Chinese herbal medicine, you know, uh, formulas for people, we always look back at the patterns. And then that's when we turn to, well, what I would say classical formulas in the text, textbooks. And through those patterns, we then prescribe Chinese herbal medicine to help reverse these patterns, to help fix the body because the ultimate goal is always boiled down. It always boils down to having good health. It boils down to having good blood health. It boils down to feeling not, and having good blood blood health helps you feel more balanced, right? As an individual and also the herbal medicine or acupuncture helping with revitalizing, restoring your organs as well. So that if all the organs work in sync, then our body is balanced and functioning perfectly, right? Yeah, the thing that is, makes so much sense. Right, but none of us yeah. are perfect. So that right. is how er, uh, Chinese herbal medicine kind of works. And um, there are a multiple, there are multitude of ways to how you can take it and receive it depending on the practitioner that you go to. Mm-hmm. Can you give us like a quick example of like a common pattern and then how you would treat it? Like ex- maybe a little explanation on like why these, what these herbs are doing in the body. Yeah, sure. So one of my favorite formulas, um, it's called Bu Zhong Yi Ti Tong. So uh, I don't, I don't remember the, the the loose English translation of it, but basically the person who has this kind of pattern has a lack of energy, um, heaviness in their muscles and body. Everything feels very sunken in, um, or fall. Like you're, you're, you're just going with gravity instead of uplifting against gravity. Right. Um, I love this formula for people who, have this kind of what we call T deficiency. So it's kind of like this lack of energy, lack of ability to, to hold the muscle tone, to feel uplifted, to run the course of your day. And in this formula, it has a couple of main ingredients, one of them being astragalus. And astragalus is known, it's in Chinese, is known as huang qi. And it's known for, to help reinforce our weight tea, which is our immunity, right? And also it has been shown to also generate the flesh. That's the, what they describe in the text. And that sounds kind of bizarre. Like, what does that mean? Um, and what that basically means is that it helps with new cell turnover. So that having new cell turnover in your body is going to have the ability for you to also raise your energy, right? Also raise your ability to have some clarity because, you know, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the self. That's a joke, right? So they always say that, but it really does help with that. Um, And also this formula is all about lifting the body as well. Yeah. Oh, that's so like, that makes so much sense because like if the cell turnover, they'll feel more alive because there's like right. fresh yeah, energy yeah, yeah. more often. Yeah. And Huangxi, they often use it in uh, beauty products as well. Okay. Yeah, Is there yeah. an English name? What was the English name Astragalus. Again? Oh, astragalus. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a commonly used Western herb. You know, when I say Chinese herbs versus Western herbs, they're, it's almost the same thing as long as you find the Latin root name of it. Um, 
you know, sometimes I just know the Chinese name, but I don't know the Latin name. So I have to Google it and reverse engineer. And I'm like, oh, right, it's this herb, right? Um, but astragalus, they use it a lot in securing your your weight's heat, which is like your outside protective shell of your body to prevent any kind of pathogen or virus that invades the body. So if you're somebody with, like I told you this pattern, like you're very sunken in, you know, you, you lack this energy, you tend to get feeble and cold and on and off chills. This is like the perfect formula for you. Mm -hmm. Um, are, are there like side effects to herbal medicine? There's always side effects. You know, okay. I always, you know. So same with regular med or similar, there's it, always something. Yeah, there's, it's it's similar, right? But I would say yeah. like the worst side effects that have typically happened with Chinese medicine, right? Um, in a formula, someone could be allergic to an herb, but they typically, you know, usually would have like an upset stomach or they'll have like a little small rash. And then you just terminate the formula. Sometimes it's hard to determine which herb from the 12 ingredients in this formula is right. So then we just find a different formula. Um, there's always ways to modify it, but I would say like, you know, I, I always tell people when you take Chinese herbal medicine, it's not for the long term. In terms of like, you're going to take it for what forever, like uh, like Western medicine, right? Like say Adderall. You know, you need to take it for ADHD forever. The goal of Chinese herbal medicine is that it's not only to treat some of your symptoms, right? But it's treating the root issue of your pattern. Why are you the way you are? And how is, is this pattern manifesting in your body? And herbs are there to help heal and restore your nervous system, your circulatory system, your organs. So then when your body is at its most optimal to a certain point, we start tapering down the herbs. And eventually the goal is you don't need the herbs or you're on a very low maintenance level for those herbs. Yeah. Do you also suggest like lifestyle changes? Is is it like, you know, do you, because obviously the pattern could come back, right? Is oh, it yeah. one of those? Absolutely. Yeah. So they have to do, they still have to do both. <laughs> you know, totally. And yeah. you know what it is? That's, that's why I always say like, you know, I'm very realistic. People have on and off seasons. You know, there's some people like go really hard one season. It's the sports they they pick up. Maybe it's the the way they have to socialize for work or stay extra, you know, for work. And that takes a toll on your body, right? And then when you're finally in your off season, you feel like you can take care of yourself. You know, I always encourage people when you're on to to have ongoing care, you know, so that you can support your modern day lifestyle. Um yeah, that's what I typically tell people. But, you know, also constitutionally, what I, and when I say the word constitutionally, what I mean by that is, you know, when we were all born, we were given a certain set of genetics. We, we were born to a certain personality and profile, you know. Um, you know, some are introverted, some are extroverted, right? And for that, like some people, you know, also have some kind of genetic issue, Whatever you, whatever you were born at your very essence are kind of like the cards you're dealt with. But mm -hmm. whatever the cards you're dealt with, you also have a choice. And, you know, as long as it's within your control, you know, you make these choices to also find the balance where you have deficits. Yeah. Um, so what would be your definition of good health <laughs> and balance? Like, what does that mean to you? How do you, how can we achieve good health? You know, it's funny. I never like truly directly answer like, this is the definition of good health and we all need to stick by it. I think I will say that um, when it comes to good health, people always kind of like nowadays, let's look, let's talk about what people think good health is nowadays. It's almost like it's, they're like trends right? Like, oh, I need to do this so I can, I need to take ashkawanda so I can, you know, like optimize like, you know, my, my, my brain function and, and, and energy. There's like or, so many vitamins and things you could oh take and gosh. it's overwhelming. The stuff that <laughs> I, I get on my everything? TikTok. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like the, like the stuff that gets advertised to me on TikTok and obviously like my, my phone machine learns me, right? Take this vitamin D, take this. And the thing is like, you know, living in a modern day society, like finding good health is just, it constantly seems to be a trend, but what it really boils down to is just about making great choices. 
And, you know, I'm guilty. Like I've followed the trends before, you know, like I realize, but what I realize is that if I try to do every single trend, I place an immense amount of pressure on myself to be perfect. And I'm, I'm like simply not perfect. You know, none of us are. I'm just a human being. I'm having a human experience, right? I hurt the way you hurt. I eat bad food sometimes, you know, and I, <laughs> and it's like, oh, I really shouldn't have had that, especially, you know, 30 plus. Um, and for me, you know, as I've gotten older, I really reflected that like having good health is just about making those great choices that are the most impactful to your life. So we make about like 35,000 choices a day, subconsciously and consciously. And what I mean by that is like the moment you wake up, should I brush my teeth? Should I not brush my teeth? Put on pants, but not put on pants. Should I call my mom? Not call my mom, right? Um, what did I say no to? You know, say no to set boundaries. What did I say yes to? Having opportunities, right? All of these choices either pour or drain away from who you are. So to me, having good health is about making those great choices that are constantly going to pour into you and less of what's taking away from you. Oh, I love that. Yeah. More that's going to nourish you versus draining your energy. Exactly. And um, a lot of Chinese medicine really embodies that, you know, like they don't say like, oh, this, this is how we set boundaries, right? Like there's, there wasn't really a word at the time for that. Um, But, you know, my professor once said to me, um, when I used to do martial arts, I told her, you know, sometimes like my back hurts from this. And she said to me, Eileen, the mind is strong, but the body is weak. Mm -hmm. And I go, what do you mean by that? And she goes, you have the willpower, but you don't have the physical power. And I said, why? And she goes, because you're not designed to do that. Right. And she goes, I won't pull you away from it. I'm going to say, maybe modify it, scale back from it. And I loved martial arts at that time. So I told myself, you know, sometimes it was about instead of going to practice five times a week, I just went three and I was happy with it because I still got to do something that I love. Right. So, um, everything in moderation, even moderation. And for (laughs) me, that's how I also make healthy choices and great choices for myself because then I don't feel like I'm constantly emptying my cup. Yeah. Yeah. Balance. So given everything that you must know from studying Chinese medicine, what are like the major things that Western culture is missing in terms of taking care of our health? Oh, the ma- I guess, the, yeah, some- the big things that pop in your mind, because there's a lot of Chinese things like don't have ice, don't expose your, your oh, that's don't wear crop favorite tops. One. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Or why don't you talk about it? Like how true is that? Should we really be listening to this? Well, you know the person who invented rice, you know, rest, ice, compress, elevate, that okay. protocol? Uh-huh. He actually retracted what he said. Oh. I think about, <gasps> about three or five years ago. He said, actually, oh, really? he's like, never mind. Like, Wait, that's like, that's like common sense for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, he was like the founder. Like, everyone's like, oh, rice. As soon as you sprain your ankle, rice, rice, this, rice, that. So, right, Chinese medicine, we hate cold. Like, that is like an absolute no-no, right? My mom used to be like, are you sad? Drink hot water. Oh, you're in pain? Drink hot water, right? And I'm like, what What doesn't hot water solve, right? <laughs> the, the funny thing is that now, as I've gotten older with every patient, I'm like, I always pour them room temp or hot water. And they're like, what are you giving me? And I go, I want you, a, I want you to... When you're here, this is like a Chinese household. You're going to have hot water. When you leave, I don't care what you have, but I want you to start thinking about how water is like, you know, we're 70% water. And in order to have, again, going back to good blood health, drinking hot water means that your body doesn't have to work as hard to warm it up because your body's already at like 98 degrees, right? So when you're drinking cold water, you're constantly damaging your gut, your digestive to work harder, to warm things up and to help your body find a level of homeostasis. So Chinese people do not like cold, but I will say, I will say I have ice cream, right? Like that's like, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm just as guilty, right? But there's ways to help manage, you know, a modern day lifestyle, you know, like when I, when I eat something a little more greasy or whatever, like I 
go to poach eye pills. Have you heard of poach eye pills? Mm-hmm. They're like these yeah. little digestive support, you know, also great for hangovers, but I don't drink. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'll take a vial of that and I'll be like, oh, I feel so much better. You know, I don't have any digestive issues. Um, I, go, I go to the bathroom easier. Those are all really important things that I, I've used Chinese medicine, you know, like I told you, like making the making the best choices for myself because, you know, like we don't live in ancient day China, you know, um, where everything was probably more whole foods and less processed, right? We live in a, what I call more processed, more influenced kind of society. So it's just finding ways to, you know, still enjoy the little things in life and then finding the balance, the things to counteract it so it doesn't do so much damage to your body. Yeah. Yeah. Can you give more examples of how you balance, like things that are accessible to people who don't know about pochai pills? Like, you know, for example, like, is it true, like, you know, how Japanese people drink green tea with their meals, like things like that? Yeah. I mean, like the number one thing is like, if I could go back to the hot water, hot mm. water is like the thing. It's the vibe. Okay. So if it, you have ice cream, drink hot water afterwards. <laughs> you know, okay. For ice cream, perfect example. Uh-huh. Yeah. You, you sometimes it's adding a little, having something a little spicy. Every time you have something cold, you want to think of something warming, having a little bit of ginger. Have you noticed that when you go to Japanese restaurants, they give you raw sushi because well, sushi is raw most of the time and you're eating raw fish, but there's always ginger on the side. It's not just to cleanse your palate, but ginger also counteracts the coldness of fish uh, as well because I it's such a that. warming yeah, yeah, yeah. Very because cool. it's so warming. Um, in my house, I constantly have onions and garlic on stock in my mm-hmm. fridge all the time. Yeah. So, like, um, when I can, I'll just like I'll just eat onions. I'll just like saute some <laughs> onions. Onions are proven to help with our lung function. You know, also has a lot of like antimicrobial uh, properties, just like garlic. So, you know, thinking of ways to find balance in my meals, the when I cook. You know, sometimes I'm a little lazy. I don't want to cook, right? Um, but when I have, you know, um, let's say when I when I get something from a restaurant, right? But if I can make a quick like little vegetable dish to go with something from I get from a restaurant to make it more balanced, I'll do that. You know, I'll cook a whole onion. I'll drink hot I water. See. Okay, that, I I love that though. It's like you can still have you know the the food that you want to have, but balance it out with, with veggies or onions or some, something else there. Cause we live in a modern day society, you know, like, um, I, I look at myself as someone who's very practical. Like if I tell somebody, you know, like, oh, you can't have ice cream forever, but behind their back, I'm you know, having ice cream. I'm just a hypocrite. You know what I mean? I just have, you know, being a Chinese medicine doctor, I just have the tools. You know, I, I know a little more to know like, oh, like if I have ice cream, you know, I'll try to have ginger tea later that night. That's another good way to counteract because it's warming. So it won't hurt my digestive as much. Okay. I love that. I feel like I need a whole, I, I need more videos on just this type of content. Like how to, <laughs> I will work on it. I will work on it. I run a clinic full time. So that's the oh, hardest yeah, part. You're, you must be so busy. Um, okay. I mean, the next question is like, do you have a wellness routine? Like what are the things that you do, whether daily or weekly to take care of your overall health? You know, it, not just in terms of Chinese medicine, um, I like to do like inventory, like a daily inventory list with myself. So like looking at my day to day, not just like my work schedule, but always cultivating time for me. Um, Being selfish is a good thing. I think like me being a female, being a woman, um, a lot of us were born into this world, like as nurturers and putting ourselves last. So, um, and also like being Asian, you know, always kind of, we have a very collectivistic culture. So like taking care of family and, you know, but also like with that comes a lot of guilt, right? So like saying no is a hard thing for a lot of us. Um, but I'm like the queen of saying no nowadays. And I say no, and I say no in a very like graceful way, um, because that's protecting my internal peace and my internal space. So, um, saying no to things that don't serve me, right. Cause that helps with my mental. I try to get at least 10,000 steps a day. Wow. You nice. know, I run around in the clinic 
But then when <laughs> I have when I have breaks, I will try to go outside and I'll go up down the streets and just and I'll take a call, I'll listen to some music, you know, try to be in touch with nature as much as I can. Um, so things don't feel as sterile in my day. Mm -hmm. Doing activities that I love, you know, not just because they're pleasing to other people, but that gives me a lot of life and energy, um, especially when it comes to physical exercise and also doing it in moderation as well. So my body doesn't deteriorate. This is about quality of life, not just the longevity of life, right? If you it, you can live as long as you want, um, but if it's being sustained by like medication and other types of life support, it's not really living, right? And lastly, I take naps. Naps are huge. Um, I think we live in a very, in America, we live in a very fast paced society. So it's, you almost feel kind of guilty taking a break for yourself, whether that's 10 minutes, 15, 20, 30. Um, but I give myself, I block it off in my work day, at least 30 minutes for a nap. Nice. <laughs> I love it. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, lastly, now that you have this platform, unexpected platform on online, mm -hmm. what do you hope to do with it? Like what's next for you? That's a great question. Um, this was super accidental. Yeah. I think when this all happened, I really didn't have any expectations. Um, I just love getting the good word out, to be quite honest. What what really lights me up is seeing the feedback that I get and people feeling better. You know, we always have skeptics and you always have haters, but the majority of people who have, you know, talked to me and expressed their gratitude, just seeing how much these simple health tips kind of empower the way they think about their health and what kind of life choices they want to make, whether that's trying acupuncture for the first time or trying a certain type of herbal formula or whatnot, um, you know, because it can help with their gut or a tea that they never heard about. These are all little things that make a huge impact um, into people's lives. So for me, I, I would like to continue that message to help people empower themselves and you know, whether that's in the press, in the articles that I write, or the videos that I continue to make, or, you know, whether that's speaking, speaking engagements, that's what I really want to achieve ultimately in the future. Love it. All right, Dr. Eileen, where can we find you online? Um, at this moment, you can find me on TikTok and Instagram. It's the same handle. It's at a new A-N-E-W dot A-C-U, a new dot A-C-U. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I learned so much today and I, there, I feel like there's so many more questions that I want to ask you, but I'll, I'll stop it here. <laughs> Definitely. But thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. 